to introduce us to Athens to part one, and today we're going to have Athens to part two. So, please join the floor. Thank you very much. Well, you remember the first part that we uh, that we talked about, and this time, this is the, Chap the famous Chapman and Andre map of 1777, and th this time we're starting from the centre of Upminster, and we're going along to Corbett's Tay, around by Stubbers, and back down and along St Mary's Lane, back into Upminster again. So a nice leisurely stroll, looking at some of the, the houses and some of the history of the, of the area. You remember last time I talked about and showed this picture, which showed the centre of Upminster from St. Lawrence Church Tower. And at the time I said that it was, it was interesting because it took me a while to work out how Henry Agis, who used to own Chestnut's garage, Agis's garage, it was on that corner, how he took that photograph. <coughs> And then, funnily enough, I was looking through some old record in the records office and came across this poster of 1908, which was the year, just the year after he took that photograph. And it had a picture of St. Lawrence Church. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, what is that there? So I blew that photograph up, and you can see. There's the scaffolding there that he took the photograph from. So that explains how he did it. It's quite strange when you start to research things, how one thing leads on to another. And maybe a year or so later, something crops up. Ah, wait a minute, that ties up with something else I was looking at. So you can see, there you are, in 1908, there was the, the scaffolding up there. And that, of course, is the view today, which I think I probably showed you before. The trees that were there, there you are, the, the trees, those trees are somewhat larger today. So when I took that photograph, I had to go somewhat higher than he did. And if you don't believe me, that's about where I took the photograph. And I, he took it from down there, but you couldn't see over the trees. And I don't mind telling you, it's bloody hairy up there. It really is. Um, you know, I thought, oh, that's an idea. I'll go up there and be able to replicate it. Um, permanent ladder so, certainly isn't, no. No, no, no. What it was, was that, in fact, I was church warden of St. Lawrence at the time. And one, what we wanted to do, firstly, the reason the ladder was up there was because it was the, uh, the quinquennial checking of the lightning conductors. There are two lightning conductors running either side of it. We're always prepared in the Church of England, you know, because in, uh, in 1640, it was struck by lightning. So we're making sure that it doesn't happen again, you know, we're always, we're always well prepared. But while, that, while the ladders were up there, we took the opportunity of getting the wind vane replaced and a new wind vane put up there. So there we are, that's the reason. But of course, that's the bell that you saw last time. That's what's happened to the bell Bring today. Back the bell. Sorry? Yeah. Bring back the bell. I know. It's terrible, isn't it? I mean, it would that's never possible. be allowed to happen today because it would be listed. It was a, it was a George, <coughs> Georgian building, as, as, you, as you well know, built in 1765 by Sir James Esdale, who really is the, one of the reasons why it's been demolished. Because... When it, the original bell was about 50 feet further behind that, when Sir James Esdale built it, he <coughs> illegally, I suppose, well, who was to say anything to him at the time, he brought it forward about 50 feet onto what was known as the waste, wasteland on either side of the road. Had he have left it back there, there'd have been no reason to have it demolished in order to straighten the road up to widen it. But sadly, that's, that's what we have. So, that's what we have there in its place. That's moved further back from where the old bell stood. Um, let's move on a little bit. Now, this was, as you know, St. Lawrence Church. The tower dates from 1215, but the remainder was largely rebuilt in uh, its Victorian, 1861. You were in the opening run, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> what, the 1215 tower? <laughs> <laughs> that was for half past 12. <laughs> but, um, this is an interesting one. 
This picture has got to be around about 1870 because it was in 1864 that the then rector gave this part of the churchyard, or, or this part of what was then the rectory gardens to be the churchyard, and they erected that fence. Now, both sides of it are part of the churchyard, but he actually, he donated it, the whole of that thing, donated it, because they were running out of ground for burials on the other side. There we are. Well, now, this hasn't changed hugely, has it? This is about 19... 35, something like that, 35, something like that. Well, the Burtons was built 1932. There's the old bell there, the bell, the bell there. The, the bus, ah, oh, but you, know, you mean, the, the bus, I can remember, the buses used to turn there. There was a car park there and the buses used to turn there and go off back up to Corbett's Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's all. That's all gone now. There used to be a mound of earth in the centre there, because as a child I used to love running up and down. Or we go up on it on our bikes and whiz down on the other side of it. But that's all gone. And my parents told me that there used to be a pond there, a small pond, which is reasonable too, for horses. Most of the little villages had some dew ponds or something like that for, for, uh, for watering their horses. Now this is in it. Now I'm sure you all recognise this. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Byron okay. Mansions and Byron Parade. And I think I told you last time the reason that it was called Byron Mansions and Byron Parade is because on that site was the High House. Not the High House in, Pran in uh, Corbett's Tay, but the original High House opposite St. Lawrence. It stood on that site. And uh, Major Howard who was killed at the Battle of Waterloo was a friend of Byron, who used to be a regular visitor to High House. And when it was demolished, it was decided to call the shop, the new building there, Byron Mansions, and the shop's Byron Parade. But next time you're there, go across the road with your back to St. Lawrence Church and just look across and if you see, look at that, it's still there. That part was hit by bombs in 1944. And the end block and the shops were totally destroyed. And you can see where it was rebuilt to match the other side. But there's the join there. So do go and have a look at that. Before, because I suspect that before long, probably someone in their wisdom will come and want to paint that or pebble dash it or something, and that little bit of little story will disappear. But there we are. So now we're moving along down, going down with the rectory, the recreation grounds on our on the right hand side, which was of course <laughs> that that field was originally owned by the church. It was glebe land and was owned by the rector at the time, and was let out to pasture for haymaking. This would be about where Iceland, I used to say Woolworths, but uh, it's now Iceland is now. Those were the, called the post office cottages. Down there is a house that is, was called, or where West Lodge used to be, which is now gone, but that West Lodge, uh, in front of what we call West Lodge, stood Bow Villa, which I'll show you in a moment, which was a very imposing building. There you are. The bell is about up there. <coughs> that's High House remaining there. Well, that was demolished. But that's those cottages. So you're looking north now. And these were the, the cottages built in about 1780 between High House and West Lodge. There you are, that's the other end. There's the, there's the bell, and there's High House, with those lovely cedar trees, which sadly were all demolished <coughs> when, that, when Byron Parade was, was built. And I just think this is a lovely photograph. You can see the road isn't made up at all, but all the, all the girls are dressed in their pinafores. Even all the boys are wearing caps. Well, yeah, they probably are, yes, yeah, yeah, they're plus fours. 
and there you are, people standing in the street, not made up at all, no proper pavements there, but very much more. That's what you see today, all this lot up here. That's where High House stood on that parade there, on that parade, sorry, there. But I'm sure you remember this. I, 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 this is how I can remember it. This was taken not long after the war. And I can remember that those shops, there were a number of shops that were empty, because this was that was built be just before the war. Then the war came. Everything came to a stop. Where the road was not made up, it, it had pavements along there, and that wide boulevard there, or, or pavement area. Yeah, well that's very much like the very first car I ever had, or more like that. It was an Austin, it was an Austin Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Most people think Austin Cambridges are the ones with the longer boot, but mine was an Austin Cambridge. A one litre car, bought it for £15, did about 23,000 miles in it, and sold it for 20. Now that's the best motoring I've ever had, <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> There we are. But do you remember Perks? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And Margaret Kay. I used to dread that place. It was a hat shop. And I've spent well many a week there one afternoon <laughs> waiting for my mother to choose various hats and things like that. And what always used to happen is that the thing that you used to do was you choose two or three hats or more. And then you take them home on approval. Could you imagine doing that now? I can remember. <laughs> on Apro. Certainly, Mrs. Noreen, then write all the details down. And then you take it home. Then you make your choice at home. And then bring back what you didn't want, you know, a few days later. But there we are. And, of course, that, you know, this was in 1949. That shows very clearly where the bell was. And how it did, in fact, project across the road. Quite a lot. <coughs> Sorry? What's this? That, well, that's all shops now. That, that became uh, uh, Woolworths, Woolworths, that shop there. Yeah. And there was the 50 shilling tailors. Remember John Collier? <coughs> we don't watch. Yeah, 50 shilling tailors. Yeah. That, we called the dumps as our, yeah, as youngsters. And we used to love belting around up and down. That people just dumped loads of rubble and goodness knows what. But we made a the start, I suppose, of the uh, off-road bikers thing. We used to belt up and down that. And I remember once falling off straight to a huge, I can remember it, into a huge pile of nettles. God, it was dreadful. I was stung to pieces. There we are. There you are. That shows, there you are. There's the 50 shilling tailors. Yeah. And this is 1950. Yeah. Now, I mentioned... This says West Lodge, but it, on the Ordnance Survey map at the time, it was called Bow Villa because of the bow front that it had. And behind it were the stable blocks, which later, when that was demolished, got enlarged and became West Lodge Country Club, or whatever it was. It was it was. Look at the outbuild. It was part of the stable block, but they enlarged it. and. Uh, well, it wasn't bad, was it? No, no, no. John Dobson owned it at one time. Yeah. Now, there you are. Mm. Do you know John Dobson? No? Yeah. Yes. John was. <coughs> well, I went to school with John. And I can tell you, if ever there was any trouble anywhere, John was at the heart of it. <laughs> and he hasn't changed. <laughs> there we are. And uh, if you don't believe me, there you are. This is, there's the, the, um, the, the church there. Down here, there you are, Bow Villa. There, and that's what that was, Bow Villa. And there's Hoppy Hall there, and Hunts on the corner. There we are. This is now looking up Corbett's Tay, with the Bell Pub there. Though that's where the library now stands. There was, and, and behind it, you can see St Lawrence Church Hall. See the taller roof there. But I can well remember those two huts. One was a British Legion hut and the other was a scout hut. And behind it, you remember this, Brian, that the, well, behind it, there was another scout hut in the <coughs> recreation ground there, which was demolished when Gridiron Place was put there. There's another story about that too, which I won't go into now, but I remember that 
amongst all the parishioners, there was a big kerfuffle about what happened about that. But there we go. There you are. This shows what it, what, what it looked like. The road has been, I believe, straightened up somewhat because it isn't quite like that. But there's the church, St. Lawrence, and the old, the original rectory there. And the, the glebe land. And there's a little boy coming home from school. We used to run in and out of those along that bank. There's a hedge there, but there was a bank. We used to run in and out of that. But by the time, of course, I, I got old enough to run in and out. They were elm trees, and about that, I seem to remember them about that wide. But uh, that was when they hadn't long been planted, I suspect. There we are. Now, this is Hunts, built by Sir James Esdale in 1776, demolished in 1935. Lovely old farmhouse. That's on the corner, that stood on the corner of Springfield Gardens. Excuse me, the chicken's fighting back. Mm -hmm. On the corner of Springfield Gardens. Do you know where Van Bros used to be? Yeah, that's right in the corner. Van Bros? Yeah. yeah, on that corner. No. That's Busty Corner, we called it. Sorry? We used to call it Busty Corner. Well, I can understand <laughs> it. Yes. <coughs> With Mr. Van Bros, <coughs> selling all his corsets and things like yeah. that. And it's strange, he was there for years and years and years. Once he sold up and retired, it seemed to change hands yeah. very regularly, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. There we are. Now, why. I'd like to show that one. Is originally, I managed to get hold of this picture that I was very kindly given. Well, actually, the front page, I was given this newspaper, and I thought, wonderful, because what it shows me is where Hunts was, Hunts there, rather, and it shows the layout of Springfield Gardens. Have you ever wondered why Springfield Gardens has got that dog leg in it? Yeah, it's not straight like all the other roads all along there. Well, the reason for that is they had to build it around the garden of Hunts. And that's <coughs> Hunts, you can just see still there, because it was demolished. This was 1935, Hunts was just about to be demolished. That's Corbett's Tay Road running up there. Those shops still remain with the Dutch gables there. And that's Stewart Avenue running down there. I wonder if it's a hill in the way. Yes, it is. You're very much you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. It is. And I'll tell you the story there. This is this is where Upminster hit the front page of the Daily Mail in 1935. Mm -hmm. What happened was that two sisters, they were the, the daughters of um, the American ambassador to Naples. And there you are. I've got the, it's a very interesting story. And I researched, went into the police records office, which, it, and these records are held in Chelmsford. And it was very interesting because I wanted to, I just managed to switch that off now. I, met, I wanted to find out exactly what the story was behind this. Because um, I remember being told about this when I was about two sisters who jumped out of an aeroplane over Upminster. And I would say went into the police records office and was able to dig out the statements and things. So I've drafted a very quick resume of what happened. Apparently on Thursday the 21st of October, of February, two workmen noticed an aircraft passing overhead at about 5,000 feet. Well, it was unusual in 1935, before the war, you didn't get aircraft every day flying over there. Suddenly, they stated, what looked like two packages fell away from it and fluttered to the ground like sheets of paper. They gathered speed and struck the ground with a terrific thud a little distance away. The workmen rushed to the spot to find the bodies of two girls lying together, face down, and with their arms about each other. One had a watch that was still going. The blade flew on. Now, shortly afterwards, the captain of the aircraft, John Curtin of Hillman Airways, was flying alone, flying, sorry, over the Channel Coast when there was air turbulence. Now, he was the only person on board, he was the only crew, just had one captain flying a, a de Havilland Rapide, or a, it was either a Rapide. Oh, a Rapide, I would, yes, yeah. Or a Dragonfly, it could be, even. Yeah. Yeah. 
But um, alone in the co cockpit, he couldn't leave his seat, so he turned and opened the communicating, communicating door to the main cabin to ask if the passengers were comfortable. To his horror, the cabin was empty. Captain Curtin radioed to Croydon and was ordered to head back to Essex <coughs> Airport, which is now Stapleford. He didn't land back where they took off at Harold, Harold <coughs> Hill, yeah. but he, they were ordered to go back to Stapleford Tawney, where Stapleford Airfield is now. And the reason for that is that there was that it was at that time manned by customs officers because it was used for international flights then. <coughs> On landing, it was discovered that the passenger entry door was partly open and had apparently only been held in place by the slipstream. In the cabin was a lady's shoe, a whiskey bottle, and sealed letters addressed to the girl's parents. The victims were found to be the Dubois sisters, Jane and Elizabeth, aged 20 and 23, daughters of Kurt Dubois, the American consul in Naples. It was at the inquest, it was decided that the explanation for the events was that the Dubois sisters had become close friends of two Royal Air Force officers, Flying Officer John A.C. Forbes and Flight Lieutenant Henry L. Beatty, a half-brother of Earl Beatty. Both were part of a nine-man crew that were killed in a flying boat crash in Sicily six days earlier. An inquest the inquest concluded that the door mechanism was not faulty, and the letters found in the cabin indicated that the, Sici that the Sicilian air crash triggered a period of severe, severe depression for both girls. <clears throat> the coroner's opinion was that it was improbable that the door could have opened accidentally, so great was the pressure of the slipstream, and suggested that it must have needed the combined strength of the two girls to have forced it. The sisters appeared to have taken a last drink together, then clasped hand in hand, their weight was thrown against the door, which opened under their combined weight. As they plunged, one lost a shoe, and they fell to the ground near the junction of Rushmere Avenue and Springfield Gardens. Well, that there is the site that they landed. There is a, a bungalow there now, and that's the bungalow that the workmen, they were gas fitters, were working in when they ran across the road finally. <coughs> so, very sad, but I remember well my parents talking to me about it. Obviously, it was before I was born. But, uh, it did. Yeah, it did, because they were running, they'd only just about two years before started the parish flight, the Paris flights. But they were sent back to Stapleford because there was uh, <coughs> customs. Um, uh, there was customs. Um, yes. And in fact, the girls, the captain, um, Captain Curtin, knew them because he'd flown them from Paris about 12 days earlier. So he he recognised them. Now this is Hoppy Hall. You know Hoppy Hall car park. That's what we have today. Sadly, it was a 17th century timber lava and plaster uh, building and it was demolished in 1936 along with those superb cedar trees mm -hmm. apparently hours literally hours before a tree preservation order was served on the on the developers i know there was a big stink <coughs> about it know anything about that brian no no no, no. <coughs> it was i mean hearing the so that's, that's what we have today. Well, you can't be responsible for everything, can you? No, 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 no. <laughs> Not quite. <a> bit. <laughs> and there you are. Now, this, this was Hoppy Hall. That was the garden of Hoppy Hall. Now, we're moving along um, towards Corbett's Tay. And I'm sure you would recognise that. No, there's the pound. That's the village pound. You're ahead of me. Sorry. Have you watched the DVD I did then on this or not? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, right. <coughs> right, well, that was the village pound there, but I'll come on to that in a moment. This was East Lodge, the, the East Lodge to Great Gains. There you are, that's looking towards Corbett's Tay. There's East Lodge there. That was the entrance to Great Gains, 
which has now become um, Little, Gaines, Little Gaines Lane. No, Gaines, yes, Little Gaines, Gaines, Lane. Lane. Little Gaines Lane. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there we are. And that was the village pound at one time there, which was fenced round. Literally, it, it had been there, well, there were records of it going way, way back. But uh, most villages had a, a pound where if there were any stray animal, animals, they were rounded up and put in there, and the owners were fined and had to pay to get them released. But there you are, that's, that's the, uh, the lodge, which is still there. But Great Gains, I, I haven't, I mean, I could do a, a talk entirely on Great Gains because there's such a fantastic history. It goes way back before the Norman Conquest. It was one of the lands, rather like Upminster Hall, where the golf club is, where you'll be going to, that was owned by King, um, King uh, Harold, Harold II, who was killed at Battle of Hastings. He owned all the land around here. It was held by Spain Svart, who was a Danish nobleman under, under um, King Harold. <coughs> and interestingly enough, he must, Spain Svart means Svein or Stephen, the Svart, the, 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 the swarthy, the swarthy, he must have been a supporter of William the Conqueror because he was a, one of the few that was allowed to hold the lands <coughs> after the conquest. Most of the others were the land, they were, the land was stripped from them. <coughs> after Svein Svart, um, Walter of Douay, who was one of the colonels of William the Conqueror, at Hastings, took it over, and there are various others, notables. Richard Fitzurse, who was the father of Reginald Fitzurse, who in 1170 was one of the four knights that murdered Thomas Beckett. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting that they, they, after murdering Thomas Beckett from Canterbury, they <coughs> went back to France, realized Henry II was not amused or realized what had happened and uh, they thought that they were going to go back and be showered with with uh, honors and lands etc for ridding the um, Henry II of this troublesome priest mm -hmm. turbulent priest and quite the opposite they were then forced to flee and they made their way back across the channel up to Scotland where they were in hiding for a while and I find it inconceivable that they didn't stay with his father on their way up to Scotland. Mm. But there you are. So that's the Fitzurses. Then there was Veo Engain, which is probably where Gaines got his name from. Engain. And the Engain family, once again, were Normans. And their predecessors were, were fought, they fought with William the Conqueror at Hastings. And he said that he was the name came about from Ed Engenis, the engineer, because he was a, a, the engineer of the engines of war for William the Conqueror. Then there were the Dane courts, the Lathams, the Dewars, then the Esdales, who were Huguenots, Claytons, and latterly Jocelyn. And there you are, that's a, a view looking down at the, the large gate there. And this was um, not Sir James Esdale's mansion. Previously on that spot was a Tudor mansion. And then Sir James Esdale bought it. He was living at New Place, where the clock house is now. He then bought that <coughs> and rebuilt it in 1771. But that didn't last very long because it was again demolished in 1920 and rebuilt with that by Mr. George Clayton. And it was demolished in finally in 1930 when it was laid out for development for housing. And there you are, this is the Ordnance Survey map of 1868 which shows there's the lodge there and there's another lodge there, the West Lodge that end. <coughs> Little Gaines is shown there, which is a bit of a puzzle, because there isn't anything there, but there is there. That's, that's Great Gaines, but there's Gaines Villa, which later became known as Little Gaines. I'll show you a picture of that. But you can see how it was all laid out very nicely. 
Had those yes, down yeah. there, which we'll right. see a little later. Yeah. Now, Mr. Tadlow was the superintendent of works for Sir James Ed Esdale, and that's where he lived. And he laid out the parkland, <coughs> dug out the lake, and built the bridge, etc. There. Now, this is Gaines Villa, built in 1821 by the Reverend John Layton, Clayton, rather, and it was later became known as Little Gaines. But going back to the layout, can you see, that's Great Gaines, and this, it was built as a dower house with a garden behind it, a kitchen garden or a, an ornamental garden of some sort. But you can see there are these buildings on the side and a porch at the front. If we go back to that, there's the porch. Just see the buildings on the side. And those are the chimneys of Great Gaines, just peeking over the, see going back, you could, if you look across there, there's the there's great games. It looks very much like Hackton House. Mm, no, it did, well, it isn't. Hackton's has got a. I've got pictures of that too. Yeah. Yeah. There we are. And this was the West Lodge. <coughs> and there you are. That shows what it was like. <laughs> there was the road, not really made up. But before, with hay ricks there, before the houses appeared. But very much, very much a rural scene. Now this was the last owner, really, of, um, of, of Great Gaines, Henry Jocelyn, DL, Deputy Lieutenant of Gaines Park. He was said to be quite a, a stickler. Um, he was, it, was, it said in, in uh, the, his, uh, the funeral oration that they gave for him, he was described as a, a typical specimen of the fine English gentleman aristocratic in bearing, and courteous to a degree. Now, you take that two ways, can't you? He was courteous to a degree. <laughs> well, all I know is, I don't know if any of you remember John Room? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Steve and, and Michael Room's dad. John Room told me when I was, I used to talk to him a lot about old Upminster, and he had a lot of old pictures and old stories. And he well remembered Henry Jocelyn, because he said, when John Room was a little boy, um, Jocelyn put the word out that he expected that all school children, if they saw him coming along in his limousine, they were expected to turn towards it and doff their caps, <laughs> which they, all the youngsters all took great exception to. So we always made sure that we turned the other way and turned our backs on them and pretended to look into the shops and things like that. But I just thought this was interesting. This is for... Um, the, the coronation of uh, Ed, this will be Edward the Seventh and Queen Alexandra, <coughs> and Jocelyn <coughs> issued invitations to a garden party to celebrate it. And they are on Tuesday, July the eighth at three o'clock. There will be children's tea at three thirty. The band, amusements, dinner in the large marquee at six thirty. This is, I think, lovely, isn't it? Muster of the whole parish at 8 o'clock at the large flagstaff. But it's rather good. Tickets not transferable. There you are. And uh, there we go. So this is now looking back from Corbett's Tay. Great gains would be over there. But that's Tadlow's, and which is still standing. Yeah, still looks exactly As I said, that got its name from the superintendent of works for great gains. But uh, I'm pleased to say that Tadlow's is being restored now. There were problems. The, the, the uh, conservation officer saying that they did have problems with the owner who wanted to put in various um, plans for changing the design of it. Now, it is a listed building, and they wanted to put in modern windows and things like that. And they had a, quite a struggle, but I'm delighted to say that the correct windows have been made for it. And, and fitted, so it's, it's coming along. But uh, at one time it was called Rolfs before it was owned by Sir James Esdale and, uh, and used by Mr. Tadlow. Now, this was Fox Hall, built in 1718, and it's almost opposite Parklands Avenue. And of course, this has all been demolished now. It was either various. Maps show it as Fox Hall, or very early ones say Vaux Hall. But 
there you are. That's it was quite a quite an impressive building. That's the road running along in front of it there. But now demolished and uh, and houses. But you may remember Richard Johnson, the actor. Mm. He was born there in 1927. There we are. Anyway, this is Parklands with the with the the uh, the bridge. That lake there was dug out by hand. It's not natural at all. So it must have taken a fair bit of work. That one of the works of. Uh, of, of Mr. Tadlow, and what he did was, if you walk all along there, up to Harwood Hall, it's dammed at the far end to raise the water level, so they, they and their dams are there, the dam is there, and that stream that runs along by Allen Ford, is it now, it used to be mm -hmm. Vassal's Garage, mm -hmm. and that stream runs along there, under the road, into, into feed this, this, this man-made lake. And that shows it in its heyday, mm -hmm. and it shows it with the all the uh, the balustrade on top, which I believe is about to be replaced shortly. They're working on it now, I believe. And this is London's, once again built by Sir James Esdale, but lived in by Dr. London, who looked after the people of London for many for many years, and that's why the. The new houses built on there is called, are called Londons. You know, they, they, that little road there is mm. Londons close, I believe. Mm. Anyway, and that shows it probably in its better times. So now we've come up to High House, not to be confused with the, with the one that stood in Upminster. But on the right hand side, still standing, is the old anchor. And it has the name, <coughs> the anchor, over the door. But it was closed as a pub in 1896. But High House goes back to about the late 1600s, uh, especially behind, owned by the Turner family. And there you are, this is um, High House's, where were we? Uh, just down there, yeah. There's the, the Huntsman and Hounds. And opposite was the um, the forge. Now I'm fairly sure that that's Jim Leach standing there. And it's very interesting because when you know the date of the photo, you can date the photograph. Um, in the, in, in the, <coughs> the records office of <coughs> Romford, dear old Simon Donoghue, who's the archivist there, is a brilliant chap. It's great, once you've got that, they've got all the rate books going right back and you can just look up each year and it will tell you who owned the freehold, who was renting it, who was leasing it, how much they paid each year, and in that period, Jim Leach was the, was the village blacksmith. And I find it, un most, it would be most strange that if a photograph was being taken, he wouldn't make sure that wouldn't, uh, or he wouldn't have made sure he was there having his photograph taken. If you go down that road, let's hope I've got these in the right order. Oh, there's Goodrum's. You notice that that's now being rebuilt, yeah. 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 along with the same footprint, because apparently it was a toll house at one time, hence the strange mm -hmm. shape of the thing there. <coughs> but it is being built on the same footprint, and I, but something has gone wrong there. I did hear something when I was at one of the council meetings a while back, that uh, it's all come to a stop, and I believe they've ex may be wrong. Um, but I understand that there's been some problem over the the build is somewhat larger than the planning permission was granted for. And there's a surprise. <coughs> but I noticed that for the past six months it's just stopped. Nothing has happened. So there we are. But this was Goodrum's Goodrum's grocery store. So you again, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> Do you recognise where this might be? Yeah, on the corner. Yeah. Next to the black. This was originally called the Georgian Dragon, and by the late 1700s it was the Royal George, and then finally the George, and it closed as a pub in 1901. Now also Miss Williams, who you may remember when I did the other talk, I showed Miss Williams as being one of the suffragettes on a, on a, uh, a, a cart in the centre of Upminster by the bell, talking to the people there. 
but she lived and she died there. She maintained that she died of the maltreatment that she received in prison when she was forced fed. But there you are, that's the that's what you have today. There you are, there's the cottage there, going back to that. There you are, there. And the horses being baited, fed on a journey, baiting the horse, um, with their nose bags. There you are, that's where they where they stood. There. So now if we go along that road towards Harvard Hall. If you, I don't know if you've ever looked, in that field, there's a grave. And it's to Bill Turner, who the Turners own the, own the land there. They also own land further along Hackton, towards Hackton. Along there. Um, and he, they got special permission for him to be buried in the field because he loved, as he said, he lived and loved this farm. So if you're along there, you can go through the little, uh, there's a pathway, you can walk along. It's kept nicely, so if you do get a chance... Is that the same Turner family that used to run the farm shop yes. next to High House? Yes. Well, Steve Turner, you know, you remember st the big lorry, Steve Turner? I went to school no, with Steve. Before my time. <laughs> he I, lived before South London. I grew up in South time. London. It's not before my <laughs> well, I, lived, I lived in South London. I'm a, I'm a new boy over oh, here. Oh, gosh. I don't know. Well, really? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good of you to admit yeah. it. <laughs> no, well, no, Steve now lives up in, uh, near Saffron Walden. Oh, okay. There you are. These were the old cottages, which the, the bare block of cottages, which very nearly came down. But I'm delighted that they've been saved. So this is the old Huntsman and Hounds. And demo this, this one was demolished in 1895. And once again, from the rate books, that was Mr. Frank H. Rowe, the publican, with some of his customers. I suppose the, that's the groom there, and someone feeding the other pony. And the customer, the, the owner, is probably inside having his lunch or beer. And there we are. Great Sunnings. That still stands. At one time, in the, at the time of Henry VII, Henry VIII's father, it was quite an estate. It was more important than Stubbers. Because at that time, there was the, the drive to eradicate wolves from this country. And each estate had to produce so many wolves a year dead wolves a year and whereas great uh, as whereas um, uh, Stubbers had to produce two wolves a year great sunnings had to produce three so it must have been a more important estate at the time but quite interesting there were some very nice uh, quite famous uh, Elizabethan or early Stuart panelling inside which between the wars disappeared to America Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, not that long ago, I know who owned it at the time, they bought it, it was actually seized by customs and excise, or it was a, a, a crime, a criminal seizure. Um, money was being printed in there. Oh, yeah. You probably may have read about yeah. that. <laughs> well, there you go. And apparently uh, Keith Bates bought it. I know, and uh, they searched everywhere, but they never found anything. It had all been searched thoroughly by um, by the police when they seized it. But it was seized by them as pro uh, proceeds of crime and sold. Keith bought it, but he wasn't very happy there. These some odd things used to happen. These strange people would be creeping around, peering in, and uh, things like that. But, uh, now, do you remember? Um, Flint House. Yes. Now, it's strange, isn't it? That disappeared overnight. Overnight, yes. It did, didn't it? Yeah. There you are. There was ballast underneath it. <laughs> Sorry? There was ballast underneath it, that's why. Uh, still is underneath it. Mm. But you say ballast underneath well, it. Well, the farm, the fields next, adjacent to it were. Well, what happened was the, that um, <coughs> it was Portland, I think, own it. Is it Portland Cement or mm. one of them? Mm -hmm. They still do own the own the, they own the land. land. Yes, yes. It was either it wasn't South End Estates. Oh no, no. Actually, I must look this one up actually because yeah. this has raised this. This has come up before. 
um, my wife knew a chap who lived in that. That, that actually was with two cottages back to back. On the other side of that was an exact replica of that. So instead of as we see the semi-detached houses today, they're side by side. This was split the other way. So where does this stand? Harwood Hall Lane. Uh, no. Right, go past the, the um, <coughs> crematorium, carry straight on, then you swing off to your right towards Stubbers. Right. As you swing off to your right, it was right on that corner. Right. There. Right. There you are. And there's the road now? swinging yeah, round here it's been to bring you to Stubbers. It's all been refilled. Now yeah. that disappeared overnight because I remember going to, riding on my bike to Stubbers because we used to play football up there. We used the field, we were able to use the field there for football matches. And it was gone. Now the, what happened was that the an application had gone in to develop the field and to extract gravel. The gravel had been extracted on the field further further on and that had finished and they were filling it. They then wanted to extract the gravel on that field that runs up towards the crematorium. And it was the 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 view was that if there were a if there was a house with two families in it, it was going to be a little bit more difficult to get permission to extract the gravel. But so therefore they got rid of them and demolished the house, but still planning permission wasn't given it, and the gravel has never been extracted from that field. So it's still there. Now we've moved on to Stubbers. How am I doing for time, by the way? You tell me when. Are we all right? Yeah? yeah? No one's saying anything. Yeah? You're happy? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, we'll crack on a little bit more. Huh. Yeah? This is Stubbers, the north front, and that was the home of the Russell family. That sadly was demolished in 1960. And I can remember that when, in, when we used to play football in the fields, actually this side of it, um, we were able to go into the house to change, and it was completely bare. Not, you know, just bare floors, not a stitch of, or a stick of furniture in it. But it was really very interesting in there. It was a pleasant, pleasant, pleasant house. Um, this is the south front, that's the north front, this is the rear view. In the days of its inhabitancy, you can see someone's having breakfast, I assume, on the, on the terrace there with the furniture laid out there, but there we are. And I just like this one because it was, it was given to me by uh, Pam Ruck, funnily enough, that we were talking about earlier on. Um, and it just shows the parlour maids of Stubbers. And that was an aunt, Ada Strutt, on the right. And I yet to ascertain the name of the dog, but uh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> there we are. And this is the farmyard at Stubbers. On the left is the dairy, and those stairs led to the servants' quarters. So it's upstairs, downstairs, or upstairs, upstairs. <laughs> now we've just moved to, moving on, before we head back to Upminster, to North Ockenden. Now there's the White Horse pub. You can see what the road was like. That was the post office there. Not made up. But once again, the girls in their pinny fours and the boys with their caps on. And that's the old bakery on the corner there, which goes back to about uh, the late 1600s. And parts of the ovens are still in there, because I know Chris Barnes lives there. And there we are. Now, this is North Ockenden School, and the, on the little road down to Mary Magdalene Church. In the reading room. Now we're back to Upminster again. Um, this is, I think you can place where this is, there's the old Mason's Arms, mm -hmm. that's replaced by one which is then again being demolished and we've now houses there. Mm -hmm. But that was Havering Building Supplies yeah. mm -hmm. and in those days, this was taken about 1926 I believe, that was known as the all you need stores. It was the village provisions. There you are. <coughs> um, that still exists. That cottage has been demolished and new houses put there. But you can see that Argyle Gardens has been marked out. 
and the road there marked out, but, the, uh, but there are no houses along there as yet. This is the, I tried to replicate oh, yes. that view yeah. today. So there you are, and that's showing the house there, that cottage there, those are all new, those ones, but I think they've done a good job in keeping the same sort of ambience there. Now this was the old Mason's Arms that was demolished in 1928. I have yet to find out who those three are. Whether it's been suggested they might be the grandparents of the Cray brothers. Some racket on the go. But I don't know, I, I've no idea who they are. I mean, there must have been some reason why a, why a photograph was taken. And there's the little girl behind in her pinafore, peering round. Uh, but they were pretty tall guys. I mean, look at the height of the saddles on their bikes. <laughs> And Glennie's entire, anyone know what? Glennie was a, is a brewer, but what entire? You see it on, occasionally on pubs, somebody's, you know, different. It's, it's really a form of porter. It's, it's got everything in it. It's not being filtered. It's, it's quite a heavy, dark, rich <coughs> beer. So that's what an entire is. And there you are. That shows those wooden cottages. There you are, with uh, the... Uh, Williams Brothers now it is, isn't it? Or William and Sons. I think mm -hmm. they, it used to be Havering Building Supplies. Mm -hmm. And there's the old Mason's Arms. Those cottage, that cottage there still exists with the overhang, the jetted floor. There you are. There it is. And there's the... So that's what you, that's what you see today. Mm -hmm. The Mason's Arms, still there. I don't know when I took this. It must have been about 2000, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And there you are. That is the Mason's Arms when it was were replayed when the previous one went. Um, those have been demolished, had been demolished, and the, that became the car park, you may remember. Mm -hmm. And down there is Victoria Row. And this is it. It took me ages, and I must thank Tony Benton, who actually put me on the track to get this because I had no idea. Got this old photograph, it was a private photograph, and it had Mrs. Marable written on the back. Yeah. Now, and it, but I didn't know what any more than that, and I'd been trying to place where on earth that could have been. Well, now we know from the, um, the census at the time. It was number one Victoria Row, St. Mary's Lane. Just on the same side as the Mason's Arms, and just a little bit further on, that little passageway that you can see, or looks like a fence along there, or a hedge, that was the walkway through under the railway arches, you know, to the, yeah. under the line that takes you through into um, uh, Daincourt, and along there. But sadly, that was blown up in 1940. And two people, uh, Robert and Fanny Mortlock, were killed when the houses were, were blown up. And there you are, that's a, a view of it. Isn't it sad? And all their furniture was piled out in the road. Probably would be taken away to what was the old Queen's Theatre, the old cinema, the old cinema in Hornchurch in Station Road, which was a repository for bombed out furniture during the war, as well as a strategic drugs depot. There you are. And that's why it's been replaced by these modern bungalows. That's what you see today. And there's the road, the little pathway, yeah. under the railway lines. When I was a little boy, it was great. You could just walk across the railway lines. It didn't have tunnels there at all. Um, then they replaced it with bridges which was not as good. And, uh, we are. Now, Mrs. Gates lived in Ivy Cottage. This little one, this little cabin, was opposite New Place Gardens in St. Mary's Lane. Um, interesting, I think, I believe, one up, one down. Now, Ivor Cooper, Ivan Cooper, rather, who gave me this picture, he's sadly now quite a been dead some years now, but we used to have many long chats about all that and stuff. Um, said that you had to go upstairs, you climbed up a ladder. 
He went round the back and went up, so up, a, up a ladder. Up there. And, there you are. and that's where it stood. That cottage still remains and is shown there. But that's why that is quite a narrow house, that one, because it was built on that lot. That was the house occupied at one time by Thomas Lewis Wilson, who wrote um, in, uh, published a superb book in 1881 about Upminster. And now we move on to, to New Place. Sadly gone, but that shows the cupola that's on top of the clock house, which was the stable block to New Place. And uh, it was demolished in 1924, but the clock house still remains and is now has been converted to flats. And Sir James Edward <coughs> lived there. He inherited it through his wife, second wife, Mary Mayer. And he became Lord Mayor of London in 1777. 1777-1778, he was Lord Mayor of London. And this shows an old map. There you are. There's New Place. That's the, that's the stable block which still exists today. But there was a turn in the front there. And behind it, as you know, the, we call the duck pond. Mm -hmm. But of course it was originally a moat. There would have been a fortified manor house on there at one time. That's why it's, it is that shape. And it goes back many, many years. And that was a new place before it was demolished, obviously. It was in 1912. And that's what replaced it, those awful buildings there, they were in turn, you can see the, the, the side of the stable block, which was the, is the, the flats, but that has gone, and wonder of wonders, look what replaces it, it's wonderful, isn't it, I mean, when you think of all the lovely designs, Georgian buildings that could have been built there, why, why, it was it, it, it's wrong, it? nice. <laughs> I may be quite wrong, but I, I no, don't blame him. <laughs> I, I, had, I did hear a rumour that they were that it was something to do with the uh, MI5. They were building, they built it as a bunker for Bin Laden, but certainly the Americans took him out and it wasn't needed, so they sold it off as flats. But uh, anyway, there we go. And this is the new, this is the, the moat at New Place, and there's New Place still standing there. That's the edge of the stable block. I tried to replicate this. There you are, there are the ladies sat on the terrace there. That, those steps are still there. They've been enlarged somewhat nowadays. But there was a boat there and the swans there. So about 100 years later, I got in the same place and the swans have got a little bit nearer in the 100 years. And you can see the wall for the stable block there with the downpipe. Now, interesting. Um, if you well, have we got five minutes, or yeah, I don't want to. You know, you've got things to do, haven't you? I mean, what time have you got to get out? Five minutes. Two. Well, you only gave me twenty minutes. He <laughs> didn't tell you which twenty minutes. Right. Right. <laughs> start. Right. right. Just, when you, there's super drug by the bell corner. Have a look at that post there. That is one of the old posts of New Place, Sir James Esdale's New Place, New Place. Now, if you look at the map, there was New Place. He owned all that land. There was the bell, there's the smithy. And he had a private walkway so he could walk to St. Lawrence Church along there, up there, and straight across there to St. Lawrence Church. So they could walk to church in their own grounds, except to where they had to cross the road. And that fence followed that all the way along there. Now, very sad story about the Esdales, but I'll come back just to show you that one on the fence in a minute. Very short, sad story. This is in St. Lawrence Church, and it tells the story there um, of Mr. John Esdale, who died in Dawlish because it's, it, it's a memorial to one of the sons of James Esdale. Um, Mr. John Esdale died in Dawlish, May the 10th, 1802, age 21. Peter Esdale died May the 1st, 
1802, age 20. So he had two sons that died in Dawlish in Devon um, within nine days of each other, which must have been a, a, a terrible blow. Why? Well, I should think almost certainly they had consumption. That's why they were sent to the West Country for the fresh air, etc. But it's a very, very sad story. Uh, further along the wall, it, it states there's a Miss Susanna Esdale, the second daughter of James Esdale and Susie. Now, fell a victim to, well, that's a classic. You know, it's highly, and so many people, especially in wealthy families who had access to lots of dairy products, which was one of the classics, so if you get um, TB, tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. <coughs> she died when she was 19. Now, it's very sad because it said that Sir James Esdale, no, sorry, James Esdale, not Sir James, James, the, one of the, the second son of Sir James Esdale, um, he fell into a deep, deep and morose mood. He was a banker and used to work, as bankers do, three days a week mm. in London. And his coachman came to pick him up one morning to take him to London. And they couldn't find him. They carried out a search and they said that they found his body under a, um, a, an espalier apple tree, 60 feet, 60 yards from the back door of New Place. Now I paced out where that was, and you can see from the old map where, if it's an espalier apple tree, it would have been in the kitchen garden. And it's about where the bowling green is there, which was the old kitchen garden of New Place, as you saw on the, on the Ordnance Survey map. This is the, this is brilliant, this, this is the day book of John Eldred, who was the village constable and also the village blacksmith. And it states there, this is his day book, for 1812, and it's wonderful. It says there the things he did. Well, this is the the uh, Esdale's accounts. So, uh, on the 7th of January, four horseshoes on Sancho, four shillings. Sancho must have been James Esdale's private horse, his own horse. That's why his name Sancho. The others are just four horses, or to four or to two two shoes on a coach horse, for example two shillings. But what's interesting, the day of his death, it states there, the 16th, four horseshoes, two shillings and eightpence. Then, Esda uh, then John Eldred has written in, this day Mr. Esdale shot himself yeah. about 10 o'clock or soon after. Very sad. Yet he's buried in the crypt of St. Lawrence Church, which is amazing because it was a a, a cry, a civil crime and a moral <coughs> crime. Normally, you, if you were a suicide, you weren't allowed to be buried. But of course, they were a very wealthy family, from many factors in the church. And interestingly <coughs> enough, this, the inquest was held in the bell by John Eldred. All the records have disappeared. I've searched everywhere. We can, I can find no records anywhere of the inquest and what the original findings were, other than Eldred's day book and the stories of the time that he shot himself. You know, he was, he was depressed. So there we are. And it says there, he died on the 16th day of January. And this is in St. Mark's Church. Now I'd better leave it here before I get... <laughs> Sorry, there's about another quarter hour, so, but I can't, you know, I can't think we will, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, again, wrong. It's got, yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Well, why do you go on so long? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. uh, so, you mentioned this archivist in Romford. Yes, Sometime Simon. Last year we were told that um, that facility was probably not going to be funded anymore. Is that any truth in that? Or what? It wasn't going to be, but thank heavens it is. Simon's still there. Yeah, great chap. So I mean, I've it? lobbied like mad to get with our councillors to get to get him kept there because they said, well, it can be handled by volunteers. But you're going to lose a... If you haven't got someone there that's dedicated to it, that knows all the files, where to go to, you can't have people drifting in one day, you know, in a couple of hours, to open up the, the archives and that. You need someone that's dedicated to it. In fact, Simon is a great guy.
Well, that's, just that's to great. let you know, know where we can put some of our records. Please do. I mean, any when I come across facts and old photographs that often people give me, say, oh, you know, great, would you like these old family photographs? And it's amazing what gets discovered. Anything I get, I scan them and give them to Simon, and then they're archived, so they're there for other people doing research. You know, you can, they'll never, they'll never deteriorate. They're always there. But, uh, anyway, any other quick questions or no? <coughs> Simon, um, please. I made my uh, plans very short and sweet because of the uh, time. <laughs> uh, I've only a couple of pages. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I find this, I find this, the talk was so very, very interesting. Yeah. Although I wasn't brought up and don't know a lot about Upminster. I, I do, oh, find do, it, do find it fascinating, yes I do now. I'm sure a lot of the fellows here who actually come from this and must have found it very, very interesting. Um, Byron Mansions, I'm sure it's been painted since uh, that was revealed. Why don't they paint it in when they don't No, they haven't painted the brickwork above it but, and the stonework. They they ash, it's ashlar stonework. Oh, then. I see. No, 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 I that's see. what I'm saying. I'm dreading that some stage, some yes. smarty is going to come along with Sentex or what are you going You know, my daughter actually lives in that flat. Um, it's privately owned. Right? It's privately owned. And the guy who she lives with would never pay to have that done. <laughs> You'll make sure. Yeah. 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 If the bell was still standing today, yeah. it would either be pulled it up or it'd be a JJ Sweatherspoon. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be a public thing. Some pubs are closed down. Bus Corp. Have you been called Anne Summers Corner? Sorry, what? Anne Summers Corner. Bus Corp. Bus Corp. Bus Corp. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's uh, all the names that you've spoken about, it's so recognisable oh, with all Jerry. the streets and everywhere else. That's you know, very, very good. Cool. So, um, well, no, I'd like to give you both say thank you very much. And, um, fellows, if you'd like to thank you.